Hi, welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Abbasi, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. I don't know, I just was tripping over my words there. Today, I want to talk about quieting the mind and focusing on one thing at a time, one thought at a time. So, um, If you've ever felt like your mind is racing a million miles a minute, this episode is for you. If you have ever felt like your mind is screaming at you, this is it. This is your episode. So I'm going to share a bit about my crazy, um, my insanity And um, I'll share about how I calm my thoughts. I work on this discipline um, daily, I try. And how um, I want to talk about how I respond to this inner voice of mine. And it is pretty loud in there. I'm not going to lie. It's gotten quieter over the years, but... So every morning I make a smoothie. Um, I buy the daily harvest like frozen cups and they have the frozen fresh whole food fruit in there along with like oats and chia seeds and that kind of thing. And um, I make the same exact flavor every day. I get it delivered like every other week, a big box of them. I get the strawberry banana peach flavor. And then it's got some other stuff that's good for you in there. I just love these. But I get out the, like, we have one of those heavy duty um, professional blenders. Like, I think it's a ninja. I'm not sure. Or if that's. I think it's the Ninja. We've had so many blenders. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but I get this blender out and it's so freaking loud. And lately I've had to like plug my ears while it's happening because it's so loud. And I think it's just because I always have a headache. So um, that's just the last thing I need is to have this loud noise. But the reason why I bring this up is because When I was drinking and I decided that I didn't need anxiety medication anymore. I know you're not supposed to do that, but I did. It took about two weeks and all like it wasn't all of a sudden. uh, It was just like growing and growing this loudness in my head and it was my it was my own voice you know it was my own inner voice my thoughts in my head and they became so loud that at one point I was working I was working from home for a family business and I was sitting in my office. Uh, it, there was nobody there at home. It was totally silent in the house. And all of a sudden, I spun my chair around and I yelled out, I can't take it anymore. That is how loud it was in my head. That's how great. That is my crazy. That's the worst that it gets for me or the worst that I had so far in my life. So my medication so i went back on the medication needless to say um i didn't yeah i'm not going to go into why i didn't think i needed it but i went back on the medic but medication and the medication although not as effective because i was drinking it quieted that down that crazy in my head um And then when I stopped drinking, it quieted it down a little more, even. Um, And, but it was still, but it's always been still a little crazy in there. It's still a little loud in there. Um, I have to work at training my thoughts and training my response 
to my thoughts. Um, so when I first got sober, it was still loud, right? Because um, when my medication was just probably full on kicking in at this point, I mean, it takes a while for all that alcohol to really get out of your system and for the obsession to get out of my system. And um, I just had thoughts racing through my head constantly. Um, and it made it difficult to, when I would go to this like meditation meeting on Fridays, it was really difficult to meditate. I didn't know the first thing about meditation. I, I really was just sitting there in the quiet room with everybody, but I still had like all of this mental chaos happening. And I remember sitting there early on and hearing all the traffic outside um, because the the place where the Club 12 um, in Leesburg, Virginia is like, um, that's a recovery place. Anyway, it's like kind of in a busy area of of the town. And it there's like a, one of the main lights of the town is there. And uh, I could just hear all of the traffic. And it was like mimicking again that my thoughts, my thoughts were as busy as that traffic was outside. So this has taken me, I can't even tell you, like this has taken me the eight years that I have been uh, working on recovery, that I've been sober. Um, and it still is something that I have to actively like acknowledge that, whoa, things are getting crazy in there, you know, like, uh, and I have to work on it. And I'm sure I always will have to work on that. But um, I had to start somewhere. And for those of you who are in early recovery, or you've been doing this for years, and you still have um, ch a challenge meditating, I have to tell you, like, um, you can meditate, you can. And, but you, you have to practice, you have to practice as much as you would practice baseball or golf or, um, sewing or painting or anything like it's that kind of practice. You just have to keep doing it. And over time, <clears throat> I don't know what happens in there, but I think it's just, um, I was able to start ignoring, I think, all of those thoughts, all of that noise. And um, it takes discipline to sit down and try this meditation thing. It takes discipline to sit down for any length of time, especially in early sobriety, I was so, so fidgety. I'm still really fidgety. I have a hard time sitting still. Um, I think this podcast is the, like the podcast episodes is the longest I actually sit in one spot during the day, other than when I take a nap. Um, I'm just a, a busy body and I wasn't a busy body when I was drinking. I was the very sedentary body <laughs> when I was drinking. But um, sober, I have to uh, make mental choices. And um, it, it's hard for me to articulate. That's why I'm kind of like trying to pick the right words. But 
Um, my point really is that discipline was very unfamiliar to me when I was drinking, which has was my whole life, mind you, you know, um, and I would always allow distractions to pull me away from whatever, you know, I was known for getting lost in my thoughts. And when I was younger, like when I was um, in middle school, I remember riding on the bus. I, I don't think I've ever told anybody this. So um, because it's it's probably going to sound silly when I say it now as a 49 year old, but when I was in middle school, I was on the bus and I think I was in sixth grade or something. And so my middle school was sixth grade to eighth grade. And I was sitting like in the, maybe the third to fourth seat from the front on the left side. And on the right side, there was an eighth grader and her friend. And I had this habit of, it's embarrassing. I had this habit of just being so lost in my thoughts that my mouth would like drop open and I'm like staring, you know, I'm, it's not exactly daydreaming because I'm just, I'm one, I'm totally consumed by whatever I'm looking at. And this served me very well in school. I was very, very attentive in my classes. Um, but this girl noticed that I was staring and she turned to me and said, why don't you take a picture? It would last longer. And I was like, so embarrassed. It, you know, it, well, it was rude of her. I get that now, but um, I've always been really embarrassed about that. And I've always been really cognizant of the fact that I will get into this zone and um, my mouth will kind of drop open <laughs> and I'm just staring because I'm just so focused and um, I try not to do it now, but I, but I still find myself doing it. Um, and when I get into a zone like that, then who knows what is happening inside my head? Like I'm focused on what I'm looking at, but I'm also, my mind is racing. I'm telling myself, I am I think I'm like building a story in my head or something. Like I'm, I'm really, I don't know. I'm, I'm completely consumed and it's been, hard for me to have any kind of discipline around that thing, that, that thing that happens with me, um, <clears throat> because it can happen no matter where I am. I can be, you know, um, <laughs> I remember being in London when I was training in London and I remember riding the tube and there was these young, I think they were like middle schoolers and they were riding the tube. And I was so surprised that these young kids, they like had uniforms on and everything that they were allowed to like ride the tube in the city by themselves to school. And I thought this is so dangerous, but I'm sure I did the same thing when I was watching them. I was creating this story in my head about what their entire world was made up of. And I'm just, I'm sure my mouth was gaping open during that time too. I just, it's so, there's so much happening in my head. And um, in order to have lasting sobriety, 
I have to learn how to quiet my mind without alcohol. And in the beginning, that's part of the hard part. That's the hard part. One of the hard parts, there we go, about being sober in the beginning is that we've taken away the drink that we were using to self-medicate and control some of these things that we don't have the discipline to control. So when you take the alcohol away, but I haven't yet adapted all of the tools that I need from the program, um, you're kind of in this very vulnerable state in the beginning. And that's one of the reasons why that first year is so difficult because we've taken away the medicine and we're learning the tools that replace the medicine, you know, the medicine, quote unquote. And we have to take that time to cultivate the discipline, learn how the, to pause, learn how to pick up the phone, learn how to respond instead of react, you know? Um, but all of that, that we're learning how to do, um, it, you know, it takes time for it to happen. And it's very um, challenging to, to do it without, you know, naked. That's what it feels like. It feels like somebody just rips your clothes off and you got to just stand there and try to deal with everything naked. I don't know. That's a stupid analogy, but that's how vulnerable it feels. So learning that, that thought management that I was talking about the other day, um, it takes time to build those strategies. And when I talk about pausing and responding, I think that it's just as important to learn how to pause and respond to our own inner voice as it is to pause and respond to the people around us. Because we're not just mending and nurturing relationships with people outside of us, like our family and friends and people that we may have hurt. We're also mending and nurturing our relationship with ourself, with our that inner voice, that self-talk. And that's the person that we have to start learning how to pause and respond to first because for me and I talked about this the other day like once I start going down this thought path that's why my mouth drops open because I it just branches out from there and I will just get absolutely consumed by whatever that thing is. So one of the strategies that has been very effective recently, I think since the fall of last year, I started, I went outside with the dogs and the, the leaves were so beautiful. Okay. It was, I've always noticed how beautiful the leaves were, but I think because I didn't have a job to rush back into, into the house, I actually went out there and I touched the leaves. Like I was walking with my dog and like, I would let him or her sniff around while I went up to the tree and I touched the leaves and I flipped them over and I was really like, I was rubbing the leaf and I was like taking it all in um, with all of my senses. 
And this was, I think, one of the, it stands out in my head as, as a very pivotal moment for me for grounding myself, for having all of my thoughts just go away and I was focused just on the leaf. I was focused on all the colors of the leaf and I actually could see like the veins of the leaf were different colors than the green around the veins. And then the ends were like red while the in in a little more was like orange and then they were yellow. Like I was really taking it all in. And this sensory awareness has been something that I've been trying to do more and more since last fall. So I planted some wildflower seeds this year on my back deck. Um, I've been doing a lot of seeds this year. I planted some herb, different herb seeds. I actually took a red pepper that I was using for dinner and I took the seeds and I planted them in a pot and they're growing. So by today I had five pepper plant seeds growing. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I will definitely update you if I have a pepper that, that comes out. But it's what I do is I go out on the back deck and I'm looking at um, all of these wildflowers. Like at this point, they're like at least a foot high. I mean, they're really tall. A couple of them have bloomed, but they're certainly not as great as they're going to be yet. And it's so cool. I've just been going out there and like touching all of the different kinds of plants that are coming from these seeds and looking at all the little buds and what they look like before they bloom, because a lot of them are buds right now. And there are some white little flowers that have bloomed and there's some orange ones and some purple ones that have bloomed so it's like it's like my own little science experiment and um it's it's really been nice to get so mentally um consumed by it's not just mental though it's all my senses rather than just mental. And um, it, it's a great, I think, mindful practice. It's, it's a great experience for being present in the moment, uh, you know, right where my feet are. So when I'm what I'm trying to do is when I feel that my thoughts are starting to spiral about whatever is happening with my medical, like doctors and stuff like that, and what is going to happen and how long do I have to go to the therapist and all that stuff, um, that I need to just go outside and it doesn't have to be outside. I can do it inside, but go outside and and look at those flowers and touch them and and pause and just focus on my surroundings it it could be you know going out there and watching a bird um there's lots of beautiful birds around here too but also feeling the texture of things in the house you know taking a deep breath and and noticing the sense around me, around me, like these small things that I can take in with my senses help to interrupt what's going on in my head. And what I've realized lately, more so than I ever have before, is how 
what's going on in my head is a totally different world than what's going on around me. Um, when I turn off all of those thoughts, which I never knew how to do until um, years into practicing meditating, um, when I am able to turn off my thoughts, sometimes I realize that I'm creating a world around me sometimes that is very unhealthy. When if I remove the if I remove these obsessive thoughts, there's nothing unhealthy about my environment. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, I can't worry about whether that makes sense or not, or else I'll keep trying to explain it on the episode. <laughs> but I have noticed also recently that I don't like, and I think I've mentioned this before, I don't like to focus on my breathing when I'm meditating um, because it just makes me feel like I can't breathe. It I start hyper focusing on how dry my nasal cavity is and stuff like that. Like I have to find something else to focus on. And touching something is, is one thing that I like to do. Um, listening to my bulldog breathe <laughs> when he's sleeping, that's a big one. That's what I do to fall asleep at night. Um, so another way of saying this is that I'm learning to not be a victim of my thinking. Um, I tend to think, or I always have thought that whatever I'm thinking is it has it it's important and it has to be addressed right now while I'm thinking it. <laughs> but the truth is is that not every thought that crosses my mind deserves my attention. It's like going up to a an all you can eat bar. I don't have to put everything on my plate. You know, I get to I get to decide what I'm going to engage with, which thought that I want to take residence in my mind and which which one I I can just let go, you know, blow by in the wind. Um this is my inner voice that has gotten so loud over the years that I have increased in anxiety. Um, that's what I take my medication for. I also have depression as well, and my medication helps with that as well. Um, and it's really managing the my inner voice because i felt like i had to engage with everything not only that but that everything was true and real every thought that i would construe every everything that i thought people thought about me um every story that i would tell myself I thought that it was true um, because I created it. And even if I, even if it maybe was unrealistic, I could shift it and turn it and mold it until it was realistic, right? Um, so I get to choose what thoughts I'm going to engage with and I get to choose what I'm going to let consume my mind. 
um, or acknowledge it and let it pass by. But I think the point here is, is that notice that I said, let it consume my mind. I get to choose which thought I'm going to let consume my mind because that's what thinking is for me. It's like the thoughts are consuming my mind rather than me picking the thought and consuming it. And that's what I feel like it should be like that my mind is the consumer, right? Um, this mental practice is something, obviously, it, this shows that I think about this a lot. Um, I, Of course I do, because we're talking about thinking <laughs> and how I have an obsessive thinker, but this, um, I feel like I've come a long way and it just started with putting down the drink. And since my stroke, this thinking problem has began to consume me again it began to consume my mind again. And I've been taking the action in order to recognize once again that I have control over which thoughts that I'm going to consume and which ones I'm gonna pass by on the all you can eat bar. <laughs> um, let somebody else eat them. So I think discipline, this, this thought management and mindfulness, it, all of it goes hand in hand. And by practicing the discipline, I am getting better at building a more structured and peaceful state of mind. And I'm able to set boundaries with myself. Um, I even have to set, I spend a lot of time looking at the clock in recovery. And the reason why is because I need to designate times for my mental activities. Um, not just because I have to control how much um, my eyes move, but I also get very fatigued as well. But there's another side to it, and that is the mental and emotional fatigue. And if I spend too much time thinking about my future, because I have to live in today, if I start trying to react to these thoughts about the future, um, I'm no longer being intentional about what I'm thinking and I'm going to get depressed again. You know, um, I mean, that's what I'm seeing the psychiatrist about because it, it's, it's scary. This is all very scary to me. And um, I I know when I first started doing this podcast a year ago, I didn't really want to say that because I wanted to be an example. You know, I wanted to be like, this is what it's like to recover. We can do this. Um, and I know that I've I've definitely gotten emotional and I've cried and in lots of episodes, but um, I don't know how much I've actually said that it's scary. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Um, but I have to plot out my time throughout the day 
that I'm going to allow myself to feel scared or feel sad. Um, and then I have to take breaks and I have to allow myself to rest and feel not feel like I have to solve all of my problems. You know, I need to choose when I'm going to work and when I'm not, you know, and for me, work is recovery now. And there are times that it is my full-time job recovery, but I can't spend eight hours a day trying to solve all of my recovery problems. Um, I have to spend time being grateful for the answers that I have, being grateful for my environment that if I don't turn off my thinker, I'm not going to notice it. Um, I don't do this so much, but you could set a timer for mental activity. Um, I usually... I usually shift activities probably about every 20 or 30 minutes during the day. Um, then I'll take a break. I'll either relax in my favorite chair in the living room, or I'll go out on the deck with the dogs, or I'll take them out for potty breaks. Um, working in 25 minute intervals, if you've never heard of it, there's a thing called I think it's pronounced Pomodoro technique. I actually had um, one of the executives at work gave me this little cube. They have little timer cubes. Um, I think it's called a Pomodoro cube. I don't know, but it had like a little timer on it <laughs> uh, to help me, I don't know, work in intervals. Um, and some people find it incredibly helpful for maintaining focus, but more than that for productivity. I, I think the reason why he gave it to me is because we were talking about how I was a multitasker and I try, I know that you can't multitask. You can only do one thing at a time, but man, I certainly tried to do multitask and I still do. I mean, my husband would tell you that I cannot do one thing. Even if I go downstairs and like start baking sourdough, um, usually I'm also doing something else, making cookies or um, cleaning something. Like I, I don't ever do just one thing. Um, so responding to our inner voice. It takes a lot of self-compassion. Um, it's easy to get frustrated when we can't quiet down our minds. Um, but if I get frustrated with myself, it's just adding to that mental noise. And um, I think I'm getting better at approaching my inner voice, you know, responding to myself with kindness and understanding. I think that I've gotten really good over the past. It's just getting better and better, like as far as how I'm responding to my own recovery and treating myself a lot more gently. Um, I feel like I, some days I'm treating myself not like a child, but like as vulnerable as I really am, you know, because I really am vulnerable right now, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I remind myself that it's okay to say that this is hard and that each moment is an opportunity to be gentle with myself and to just practice that. I don't have to be great at this. That's what recovery is for. That's what it should be. 
it's a time to recognize how very sick we are, you know? Um, and I forget that a lot. Um, I am really sick or else I would be working or else I would be able to walk further than around the block. I would be able to watch TV. Uh, you know, I would be able to do a lot of things. Sorry, my back is killing me. <laughs> I'm uh, there you go. I'm very sick. Uh, my back's killing me. I keep moving around. Um, but I think that I forget how, how sick I am. Um, and I need to recognize that when I'm sitting with my inner voice, you know, so quieting, quieting our mind takes discipline, um, uh, mindfulness, self-compassion whenever i hear the word discipline i think of queen elizabeth i know that that's weird but if you've watched the show crown then you're very familiar they they show like her um evening routine and her morning routine and her all of her routines and she's just she was very disciplined and i'm inspired by her discipline um, that, that she had to engage in her whole life in order to, um, be who she was. And that inspires, I love being reminded of that. I should watch. Oh, I can't. I was going to say I could, I want to watch crown again. I guess I could listen to it. That doesn't seem as fun. Um, anyway, by, uh, using, try using your senses a little more, you know, try pulling in touch and smell and, um, breathe in like the fresh air. I don't know. I'm just, I guess I have a lot more time for sure to do that stuff, but getting a little more in touch with my senses helps me to practice mental discipline. And um, it helps me to create a calmer environment, you know, around me. A, I guess it's a calmer envi environment within me, probably. But we do have the power to choose which thoughts we engage with and which ones we let blow away. So I'm just gonna keep working on that. It's gonna take a lifetime, but thank you for joining me today. If you enjoy the episode, please subscribe and I will talk to you tomorrow.